This video was inspired by you guys. Let me explain. A couple of weeks ago, I posted a video about Thomas Sudoff, a Nobel Prize winning scientist from Stanford University, whose work has recently come under a lot of scrutiny as many anomalies have been found in his papers. One of his papers has already been retracted because of clear data manipulation as confirmed by a third party reviewer. However, most of the anomalies found in Sudoff's work were not of this nature. Instead, they were to do with duplicate images. If you've seen that video, you'll remember me showing you evidence like this, and in the weeks since I posted that video, more evidence has come forward of duplications in other papers by Sudoff, like these ones shown on screen right now. Now, if you don't know why this is problematic, here's Elizabeth Bick explaining in an interview I did with her. So everything in nature, more or less, uh, you know, making a generalization here, mm. is unique. Uh, two leaves uh, are never identical, two rocks are always slightly different, and so if you think about uh, cells or tissues or or Western blots, the the patterns that you see there might be similar, but they're not supposed to be identical. So if you see identity, then that is usually not good. So duplicates equals fraud. Sudoff's busted, right? Clean and simple. Or is it? You see, this video was weird because I've talked about image duplication in many other of my videos. Many different scientists from many different universities showing similar types of image duplication in their work. And most of the time when I post these videos, you guys are in the comments being like, yeah, clearly busted. Many of you are far more qualified than I am, confirming my suspicions in the comments saying that yes, this looks very suspicious. But this time when I talked about Thomas Sudoff, there was a large number of comments referring to some kind of Xerox scanner issue. In fact, it wasn't just comments on my video, but I got several emails from you guys telling me to look into this Xerox scanner hypothesis. Xerox scanner hypothesis? I mean, I'm 25 years old, which technically means I'm Gen Z. I've literally never scanned a document in my life. So I have no idea what you guys were talking about, so I decided to look into it. And what I found turned out to be actually very interesting, and I thought I'd share it with you in this video today. So after you've watched this video, you guys can tell me if you think that this is a reasonable or plausible explanation for the things that were found in Sudov's work. But if you think talking about boom attack like Xerox scanners is something that'll put you to sleep, I promise you it's really interesting. But you know what will help you sleep? The sponsor of today's video, which is Manta Sleep, who I'll now briefly thank. So Manta Sleep are a company that make very high quality sleep masks. So I've been using the Manta Sleep Pro for a couple of weeks now, and I have to say that they are very comfortable, very breathable, and the 100% blackout has resulted in me getting deeper and more restful sleep. My wife has also been using the Manta Sleep Mask Sound. This one is really great if you're one of those people who loves to listen to things when you fall asleep, like white noise or a meditation or whatever. The reason why this one is great for that is because they have integrated ultra flat Bluetooth headphones built into them. So because these headphones are so thin and flat, even if you're a side sleeper, it is still very comfortable. If you've ever tried to sleep with, you know, wireless earbuds in your ears, you know the struggle and how uncomfortable it is. Both of these masks come with adjustable eye cups, so you can adjust them to whatever shape your face is to ensure a comfortable fit. So if you want to give Manta Sleep Masks a go, then check out my link in the description, or you can use code PETE at checkout and you'll get 10% off your order. Thank you so much to Manta Sleep for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to talking about this Xerox hypothesis. So the Xerox scandal broke in 2013, and it was discovered by a German researcher called David Kriesel. Sorry, David, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. And it all started for David when this happened. The company said, hey, David, if we scan the blueprint to a PDF, then there are different numbers on them. Can you take a look at that? So David was contacted by a company that told him this and he decided to investigate. So this is what he found. So the measurements from the original blueprint are in this first column labeled original. And as you can see, the square footage of each of the three places is 14.13, 21.11 and 17.42 meters squared. And what each subsequent column represents is the result of a different scan from a different Xerox machine. And as you can see, the scanners totally messed it up. In the first of the Xerox columns, now all three places are at the exact same square footage. The same is true in the second one. And in the third one, it got two of the places correct, but now one has the same square footage as place three. So that's wrong. And then the last column is also wrong, but in a different way again. So that was the first example of this that David found, but he decided to do a little bit more digging. So here's yet another example. This time we're looking at numbers entered in a cost register. And as you can see, after scanning, some of the sixes have been turned 
into eights. So obviously when David found this out, he realized that this was a big problem. These Xerox work center machines were in offices all over the world and scans from these machines were being used for all kinds of important functions from cost registers to architectural drawings to accounting to potentially Obama's birth certificate, which was a very hot topic at the time. So clearly this was a big scandal. And when the news broke about this, there were articles in all kinds of different media outlets, including The Economist, the BBC and The Verge. It was big news. So why was this happening when people were scanning documents in through these Xerox scanners? Well, it turns out it was to do with the image format that these Xerox machines were using. You've heard of other image formats before, things like JPEG or GIF. The image format that these Xerox machines were using was something called JBIG2. And the way it worked was like this. So if you scanned a document that had these elements, a photo and then some letters, the Xerox scanners would isolate each of these different elements and treat them as a pattern. And then the algorithm would look for similar looking symbols and treat them as matching patterns. So then when the scan was reproduced, it would treat all of the similar patterns as exactly the same, which would then save the amount of memory that the machine had to use. Apparently, this is quite a common technique. It's called pattern matching. And theoretically, it's a way to reproduce text-based documents in a way that is accurate, but also saving a lot of memory. However, when it came to these Xerox machines, their pattern matching was not very accurate. So what ended up happening was that similar looking symbols that were actually different ended up becoming duplicated in the scanned document. So as you can see, here, this is what happened to that document after it had been scanned by the Xerox scanner. So as you can see, the scanner ended up confusing the L and the I and got them mixed up. And then it also treated O and Q as the same symbol. So now in the alphabet, we have two O's and no Q. And once again, a number six has been turned into a number eight. But notice how the organic image was completely unaffected. The image of the fly stuck to the plant. The plant, I believe, is a drosera, if you're curious, a type of carnivorous sticky plant. And so the image of this fly stuck to the drosera is completely unaffected because the shape is so complex and organic that the algorithm treated that entire thing as one symbol. So remember that the organic shape was completely unaffected. It was only the text-based stuff that was affected. Remember that, because I'll loop back to it in a second. So does does a dodgy Xerox scanner explain Elizabeth Bick's findings in Sudoff's work? Well, Sudoff seems to think so, or at least he thinks that something similar has been going on. This is what he wrote on PubPeer. The most plausible resolution, as for some other observed image manipulations alleged by accusers, is that the image processing software induces duplications of internal image components when the software perceives these components to be the same, even if they are not, exactly as I explained. Digitization and compression algorithms, especially older ones, use pattern matching and economize by simply duplicating matched patterns. The error was, for example, observed with old Xerox copy machines. And then later on in this post, he says, this has also been documented for immunocytochemistry images in older papers. And then he provides a link to the paper where he thinks that this kind of issue occurred. However, if you actually click on that link that he provided, you'll realize that it's actually not related to a Xerox scanner or pattern matching at all. Instead, it was an issue when the journal decided to Photoshop the original author's work for stylistic reasons and basically messed it up. And you can tell that this was the case because the issue only occurs around where the label were A, B, C, D, etc., which is where the journal had changed the author's original figures. So nothing to do with Xerox or JPEG2 or any kind of compression algorithm here at all. So not a great example from Sudov. However, does his argument still stand? Well, here's my take, but take this with a large pinch of salt because obviously I have no special or insider knowledge as to how Sudov and his colleagues do their work. But from my understanding of how Western blots work, there is no need for a Xerox scanner to be involved. That is for sure. You do the blots in one machine and then the image is taken by another the machine, an imaging machine, which is then plugged straight into the computer. So there's no need to print or scan anything in between that process. And as far as I can see, there's no reason for any kind of physical copy to be printed and scanned in at any point during the process between obtaining the blots and publishing of the paper. You could argue that perhaps the journal who published the paper had printed it and scanned it at some point, which might have led to these kinds of issues, but then we might expect to see those issues in the actual text of the paper and not just in the images themselves. So it seems a little bit unlikely. Plus, even if a Xerox scanner was involved in this process, would this explain the kind of duplications that we see? Probably not. You'll remember me talking about the organic image of the fly and the Drosera compared to the text-based information. The bug that was affecting the Xerox scanner seemed to only affect text-based information and not organic looking images. So I wouldn't expect an organically shaped image like a Western blot to be affected. However, I can already see some of you in the comments being like, well, a Western blot is not as complex as the photo of the fly on the Drosera. So, okay, 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 fair point. But nevertheless, I, I doubt that a Xerox scanner was involved at any point in this process. So what's something else going on here? So does the compression argument still stand? Well, 
it's possible, even though a Xerox scanner wasn't involved in this, it's possible that the imaging machine that Sudolf and his colleagues were using in the lab used a similar type of pattern matching algorithm that created the same kinds of results. However, that would be an absolutely insane thing to have programmed into a machine whose only job is to take photos of Western blots. And so to have a kind of compression algorithm that would mess up photos of Western blots when that's its only job, seems insane to me. But if that is true, then this problem is way bigger than Sudoff and Elizabeth Bick. This would be a massive scandal because it would mean that huge swathes of the medical research literature would be invalid because they would all be subject to these issues if the lab that produced these results used the same type of machine. If that's the case, then that would mean a huge overhaul would need to happen where all the original files from all of these affected papers would need to be found if they even still exist. It would be a massive, massive scandal. So is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but it does feel a little bit tinfoil hat. I mean, like, what's more likely that dozens, maybe hundreds of labs across the world all have dodgy machines, all producing dodgy results and no one has noticed until now? Or is it more likely that a few dodgy scientists got a bit cheeky on Photoshop because they're highly incentivized to do so? Right, you tell me what's more likely. Obviously, I don't know for sure, and personally, I don't have the means to investigate this myself. However, maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you have access to Western blot machines. Sudoff, if you're watching this video, maybe this is something that you might want to look into, given it would both absolve you of any of these accusations against you and it would be doing the scientific community a huge favor. So those are my thoughts on the Xerox hypothesis. Thank you to all of you who brought this to my attention in my comments and in my email inbox. I really appreciate sort of the crowdsourcing theory crafting on this. It's really interesting and great to see. A special thank you to David Creasel for discovering the Xerox hypothesis in the first place. The visuals that I used to illustrate this Xerox bug came from David Creasel's slides on a talk that he gave eight years ago. So I'll have a link to that in the description if you want to learn more. Okay, so thank you guys all for watching. Let me know what you think of the Xerox hypothesis in the comments below. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Let's get to 100,000 subscribers this week. That would be totally amazing. All right, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Please subscribe, bye.